The Big Bang Theory. While it might be best known as an American sitcom, it's a lot more than that. It's the origin story of our universe, although it's still somewhere in the draft stages. There's a lot that astrophysicists still don't know about the Big Bang. But if you're like me and not an astrophysicist, here's a compilation to catch you up on what we know so far. This video is your beginner's guide to the Big Bang, an introduction to the who, what, when, and where of this cosmic event and how we discovered it. Hank's gonna kick us off with a bit of what the Big Bang even is and where it happened. Just under a century ago, we learned that the universe is expanding. And by rewinding that expansion, we learned that reality as we know it had a beginning. Astronomers refer to it as the Big Bang. But although that is an awesome name, it can also be kind of misleading. The Big Bang makes it sound like there was a big explosion in one particular spot. So then, if that's the case, where did it happen? Well, this is the thing. The Big Bang happened everywhere. According to this theory, nearly 14 billion years ago, all of space began expanding in every direction at once. Then, some of that energy got converted into matter, which eventually coalesced into stars and planets and other wonderful things like dogs. Now, when we talk about this, the image that comes to mind is that of a baby universe starting as a teeny tiny ball of light, which then explodes out into some kind of space that already exists. But that's not the story, although it is way easier to picture. In reality, all of space is expanding into nothing. It's just expanding. There is no central point where everything began. It's more like all of space just started out small, and space itself has been expanding ever since. So maybe it will help to talk about how we know this. Well, some of the evidence that tells us the Big Bang happened also tells us what it was like. For instance, what really sealed the deal on the idea of the Big Bang at all was the discovery of cosmic microwave background radiation. Basically, according to the Big Bang theory, some energy left over from our baby universe would spend the rest of time radiating throughout space in the form of light. The expansion of space would stretch those light waves out well beyond the visible range, but they would still be out there. And we detected that radiation back in 1965. It was a kind of radio static that just couldn't be filtered out, and it came from every direction in the sky. That cosmic microwave background is called the CMB for short. It dates back to around 380,000 years after the Big Bang, because before that time, it was so hot that the universe was opaque. And besides backing up the fact that the Big Bang happened, the CMB also proves that it happened everywhere. See, some of the most recent images come from the ESA's Planck mission. And while there are some spots in the CMB that are a tiny bit cooler and a tiny bit warmer, overall, the CMB is isotropic. That means that it looks the same no matter where you point your telescope. It also appears to be homogeneous, as far as we can tell. In other words, the picture of the CMB would look the same whether you're taking it from the Milky Way or the Andromeda Galaxy or any other galaxy in the universe, no matter what direction you're pointing your telescope in. If the Big Bang happened in one spot and somehow spread out into space that already existed, the CMB wouldn't look as uniform as it does. Instead, there might be hotter and colder spots that would point to a more specific location where everything began. But the CMB isn't our only line of evidence here. We can also see isotropy in the universe by mapping much younger structures, like galaxies. On cosmic scales of a billion light years or so, they look uniformly spread out in every direction. When you zoom in, you see a web-like structure, which exists because matter likes to gravitationally affect other matter instead of distributing itself evenly across the cosmos. But when we measure these galaxies' trajectories, nearly everything appears to be flying away from us, which is either a very lucky coincidence, or it means that every other vantage point is seeing the same thing. The classic analogy people use to explain this is an expanding balloon. From one point on the surface of the balloon, it looks like the rest of the balloon is moving away from you equally in every direction, but that's also true from every other point on the balloon, too. There is no official center. Everything is just expanding. And that's what the Big Bang Theory necessitates, a universe that's expanding outward in every direction. Of course, there are a few exceptions where the pull of gravity can overcome the expansion. Like the Andromeda Galaxy is close enough to us that it's scheduled to collide with us in the future. It's also worth noting that the whole discussion is limited by our solitary view of the universe. Because of the finite speed of light and the limited life of the universe, we can only see so much from the Earth, and we don't have technology that would allow 
allow us to go to another galaxy and confirm that that view of the universe also looks isotropic and homogeneous. So when we say that the Big Bang happened everywhere, we can only base that theory on the part of the universe that we can see. But given what we've been able to discover so far, well, if you want to say that you're the center of the universe, go right ahead. You just have to recognize that everyone else is, too. So space is expanding into nothing. Well, that calls for an existential crisis. But that dread will have to wait till you're trying to get to sleep tonight, because we have more incredible news. Hank breezed past a big part of that Big Bang discovery. Bird poop. Who knew the who and how of the Big Bang's discovery was a story of life, death, and bird poop? Past me has the honor of telling you that story now. What do penicillin, nuclear fission, and microwave ovens have in common? Not a lot, but they do happen to all be things that scientists discovered by accident. We have this image of scientists going out to prove a thing all focused and purposeful. And yeah, that definitely does happen. But there are also dozens of discoveries in science that happen totally randomly. Take the Big Bang, for example. For a long time, it was just an idea, and there wasn't much good evidence to support it. That changed in 1964 by accident. Astronomers Arno Penzias and Robert Wilson were setting up their large horn antenna, basically a giant microwave detector. To their surprise, the detector seemed to be picking up a bunch of static, like the snow and hiss on an old-fashioned TV. Their first thought was that they must have messed something up, and they tried everything to fix it, including getting rid of a flock of pigeons roosting inside the detector. It didn't even occur to them that they might have found evidence for the most important event in the history of the universe the Big Bang. According to the Big Bang Theory, all the matter in the universe was once squashed together into an incredibly dense hot point. It then exploded outwards in, well, a bang, forming the universe we know today. One of the predictions of the Big Bang is that all the radiation that was once produced in that super hot state should still be around today, just really hard to detect. As the universe expands, everything moves away from everything else, which causes electromagnetic waves, like light, to stretch out in what's known as redshift. And the electromagnetic radiation from the Big Bang has redshifted so much over the last 13.8 billion years that it's now in the microwave part of the spectrum. That's the static that Penzias and Wilson were picking up with their detector. But it took a while for them to realize what they discovered, because they were using their huge horn antenna for a totally different reason. They were looking for faint sources of radiation in the Milky Way that might damage communication satellites. In fact, the horn antenna was built to help develop those satellites. It was first used to detect microwaves bouncing off of what was basically giant metal balloons the first try at making something like a communication satellite. So this was all very important work, but for their experiment, they had to remove all other sources of interference. That meant that when they detected a weird background static in every direction, nonstop, day and night, it was a huge pain in the butt. They had to find out what it was and get rid of it, and they had to do it ASAP. They started out by cooling their detector down to four degrees above absolute zero using liquid helium, which wiped out most possible sources of static. But the background noise was still there. Next, they wondered if it could be coming from human sources, so they pointed their detector at New York City to see if the static would get worse. But nope, it didn't change. Finally, they did some calculations to show that it couldn't be from a military source either. Eventually, they concluded that the static couldn't be coming from Earth or from the Milky Way galaxy. Then, one day, they noticed something in the antenna bird droppings. It turned out pigeons had been roosting inside their antenna, and they thought they'd finally found the source of the static. They cleaned out the droppings and did everything they could to get rid of the birds, but the pigeons kept coming back. Finally, they just shot the birds. An instant death for sure, but they still felt pretty bad about it. It probably felt even worse when they turned on the detector, and the static hadn't gone away. So it wasn't in the detector, and it wasn't from the Earth, and it wasn't from the Milky Way. That left only one possibility. The static had to be coming from outside our galaxy. But they had no idea what could cause such a thing. Around this time, Penzias was chatting with a colleague who happened to mention that a group of scientists at Princeton were getting ready to look for a microwave background signal to help learn more about the Big Bang. Suddenly, Penzias realized how important that background static might be after all. He contacted the scientists from Princeton and invited them to see the detector. 
the signal looked exactly like what they were looking for. They'd found cosmic microwave background radiation, confirming a key prediction of the Big Bang. They ended up publishing a joint paper, and just like that, the Big Bang Theory went straight to the forefront of physics, earning Penzias and Wilson a Nobel Prize in 1978. It was a great story for Penzias and Wilson, even though it wasn't so great for the birds. But at least those pigeons gave their lives for a good cause. They helped us learn more about how the entire universe came to exist. It turns out, the cosmic microwave background didn't just help scientists discover that the Big Bang happened, it also showed them when it happened. So, Caitlin, how old is the universe? One thing that humans simply cannot stop doing is trying to figure out where we came from and why we exist. That's like our big thing. That and getting really inventive with fried foods, but that's a subject for another channel. Philosophers and fry cooks are still working on those questions, but science can at least answer one thing when the universe began. And right now, we're pretty confident that it all happened around 13.8 billion years ago with the Big Bang. Figuring that out hasn't been easy, and our estimates could still get better. But thanks to some useful tools and a lot of math, we're off to a really good start. To calculate the age of the universe, astronomers use two main tools, or pieces of evidence. The first is pretty intuitive. They look for old stuff. For the most part, that means looking at really far away stuff. See, the universe has been expanding ever since the Big Bang, so the very oldest objects have been hurtling away from the Earth for billions of years. And based on how far an object is, astronomers can get a rough idea of how old it is. So far, using photos like ones from the Hubble Space Telescope, researchers have been able to find clusters of stars as old as 13.2 billion years. But they don't know the stars are old just by looking at them. To figure it out, they have to take into account some of the cool, weird ways that light behaves. See, as the universe expands, it also stretches the light waves traveling through it. So if a star is moving away from Earth, its light will be stretched and have a longer wavelength by the time it gets to us. This is called redshift. By seeing how stretched or redshifted a star's light is, and doing some math, astronomers can get a rough idea of how far and how old a star is. But that isn't the only tool they use, because even though we can detect some faraway objects, others are still really difficult to observe over those large distances. Mostly, this just tells us that the universe has to be at least 13.2 billion years old. To refine the estimate, astronomers also use measurements about the expansion of the universe itself. We've known the universe was expanding since the late 1920s, but understanding how it's expanding is what's a especially useful. Knowing how fast it's happening and how that speed is changing really allows researchers to work backwards from right now to find out exactly when the universe was a tiny seed of everything. It's basically like how a forensic scientist can study an explosion site and tell you when the bomb went off. Just with a much bigger bomb in this case. Two major discoveries have helped us understand this expansion. The first was type 1a supernovas, which form from the explosion of a tiny white dwarf star and some other stellar companion. In 2011, a team of scientists won a Nobel Prize for using them to prove that the universe's expansion is getting faster. These supernovas are extremely bright, and their brightnesses are all pretty uniform, so one of them will look a lot like any other. This makes them really good for calculating distances, or what astronomers call standard candles. Since we know what their brightnesses should be at any given distance, whether it's a million or a billion light years away, they're easy to use in measurements. And after years of measurements, astronomers noticed that the redshifts for these supernovas was a lot smaller than they should have been for galaxies so far away. That means that sometime after the supernovas emitted their light, they actually got farther from Earth than expected. That can only be explained by a universe that's expanding faster as the years go on although we aren't positive what's causing that to happen. But it has helped us understand when the Big Bang happened. Before we knew that the expansion of the universe was accelerating, our calculations about its age could be pretty inaccurate. Astronomers used to assume a constant rate of expansion. So if you're working backwards from our current rate, you'd get a universe that's way too young. Or if you picked a bad standard candle, you'd get inaccurate measurements too. For example, Hubble's original calculations from the 1920s used a type of star called a Cepheid variable as the standard candle. And that suggested the universe was about 2 billion years old. Which is definitely not right. Science is a process. Still, type 1a supernovas aren't the only way we've studied how the universe is expanding. The other way we figured out the rate of expansion is with the cosmic microwave background, or CMB, which is the energetic glow left over from the Big Bang. Well, it's not wildly energetic. It comes in at 2.7 Kelvin, or about negative 270 degrees Celsius. But it's not 2.7 Kelvin everywhere you look, and that's super useful to us. Those temperature variations can tell us about the movement of objects and the densities of gases in the universe, both of which are used in calculating the universe's rate of expansion. And along with type 1a supernovas, these studies have allowed us to get a much more precise picture of how the universe has been growing since it began. That's let us zero in on our current age estimate, 13.8 billion years. And our observations are just going to get better from here on out. 
We think 13.8 billion is pretty solid, but don't be surprised if you hear that number change a little bit as we make better observations. It just means we're getting better at science. We've learned so much about our universe's beginnings, but we still don't know why it happened. And we may never know. That's a tough pill to swallow for any of us, especially kids whose favorite question seems to be why. So to satisfy at least some of the questions those curious kids might ask, there's a SciShow Kids video with the Big Bang Basics. And thanks, as always, for exploring the universe with us. 